Happy Sabbath, church. I'm just going to ask Max a question. Um, are you afraid of anything? What are you afraid of? Nothing. Nothing? What would be something that you're afraid of? Nothing. Why not? I said nothing. Why? Because. Why aren't you afraid? I've done this many times. Okay. He's not afraid to do this right now. He said, I've done this many times, so I'm not afraid. But I think all of us do have some fears, and I think that they increase as we get older. Um, Max might be afraid of thunder. I might be afraid of disease progression in my husband. Um, Max might be afraid of sharks. I might be afraid of a shark eating my husband when he surfs, um, which literally almost happened. Just a minute, honey. Um, But as you get older, your fears just increase. But fears are just opportunities, I think, to trust. Becky and I were talking about what to do with worry. There's no place in our life for worry if we trust in God. And Benji's Bible verse this morning was, um, my God shall supply all your needs, so we have no reason to fear. That's what this song is about. Benji, no touching the piano, okay? You unravel me with the melody you surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone i'm no longer a slave to fear i child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to my family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. You drown my fears in perfect love. You rescued me and I will stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. You drowned my fears in perfect love. You rescued me and I will stand and sing. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. So beautiful. It's good to reaffirm that, isn't it? In our minds, we are 
the children of God. We are God's children. We need to affirm that all the time. Because when we know that we're God's children, we will live as God's children. This morning we're going to be blessed as uh, Matt Para brings us a message. He is the director he's, of the Person Ministries Evangelism and Sabbath School Departments of the North New South Wales Conference in Australia. He's in charge of evangelism, evangelism training, all the person ministries activities, Sabbath school activities, and also they partner with Arise, David Asherick, and Light Bears uh, Ministry in Australia. It's always a delight to have uh, Matt with us. We're always delighted to see the children and how they grow, and 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 to be blessed to um, be with Sharice and the children and Matt. So God bless you as you bring the message today. Thank you, Matt, so much. I bring you greetings from Australia, um, the upside down place, down under. Um, I think of the uh, verse in Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus basically says, um, who are my mother and brothers? Who is my sister? And then he holds out his arm and he, he points to his disciples and he said, see, my mother and my brothers. Whosoever therefore shall do the will of my father, the same is my mother, and the same are my brothers. And so, you have brothers, and you have sisters and mothers in Australia, and so I've come to say to you all, hello, greetings from those brothers and sisters in Jesus that you have in Australia. It's a pleasure to be here on holiday. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to just relax for a while. So thank you, Pastor Putt, for the invitation to preach. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's fantastic to be here. There's no pressure, right? There's no pressure when you're preaching on your holiday. Everyone knows, that, hey, he's on holiday. Give him a break. Right? It was a little boring, but hey, he's on holiday. <laughs> um, yeah, you never know when a biblical scholar is going to show up for your sermon. That's great. Um, I don't know if you guys caught the introduction to one of our brothers here this morning. And uh, that's really exciting, uh, thrilling. Uh, there's a few things I wanted to say by the way of introduction, but I won't, I'll spare you too much time. Oh, I'd like to say uh, good almost afternoon to you all. Um, <laughs> it's always exciting to stand up and to know that there's a professional biblical scholar in the church while you're preaching. Um, and it's two minutes till 12. Excellent. So I've got about a 35-minute sermon, and we'll be done in about 1 minute and 58 seconds, I think. It's just cute. It's a pleasure to be here, um, for sure. And thank you, Pastor Putt, for the opportunity to share, and the elders of this church. Um, you are God's men and women here in this part of the world, and so I'm honored by the fact that you would allow me to stand here and share Scripture with my brothers and sisters in this church. Surely, I'm not worthy in that I don't actually deserve to speak on God's behalf. And God is tremendously gracious. And He allows very, very, very imperfect people to represent Him and to communicate on His behalf. And so praise Him for that. It's great. Um, I'm just going to have a short word of prayer. But before I do, I just wanted to let you know before the sermon um, that I like to surf. It's a big part of my life. And I'm very privileged to live just about a four and a half to six minute drive, depending on how much I speed, uh, from the beach. And uh, oftentimes throughout the course of the week, if the waves are good, I'll get up really early, I'll do my devotions, say my prayers, read, read the Word of God, and then go off for a quick surf before I've got to head down to the conference office in Wall's End um, and spend my day there doing administrative duties and, and different kinds of service for the Lord. And it was amazing when I learned what I'm going to teach you right now from the Bible. And that is that God also is a surfer. Yeah, he is. And, and you may have never heard this before. This may be new light for you, new truth. 
But when I learned and discovered this new truth, I was so absolutely thrilled because when I tell my wife that I'm going surfing, now I can say, honey, I'm going to go follow the Lord. That's right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God's a surfer. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We're very grateful. We're very, very grateful with all of the imperfections and flaws of our nation. We're free. We're free to worship um, and to choose to believe as, as you inspire us to believe. Lord in heaven, I just ask that you would give me your spirit, that you'd guide our thoughts and our understanding. Whether new or whether old, we ask that you would inspire us through this information that I share with the church this morning. In spite of me, we pray that you would You'd bless us. Help me to be concise, to the point. Give me clarity, please. And, and above all else, give everyone here an ear to hear. May we take personal responsibility for our own salvation. May we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it's you who's working in us, inspiring us to do so. So help us to listen and to engage with your word to be active listeners, to, to make a commitment to know you more through this time. Um, Lord, we thank you for hearing us and answering us in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'd like to begin the message this morning, which is entitled, The Sign of God's Unfailing Love, um, in Genesis chapter 1 and beginning in verse 3 and 4. Right here in the very uh, beginning of the Bible, we have the creation account. And the Bible says in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, Then God said, let there be light. This is obviously right after what I was quoting in regards to God being a surfer. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. So darkness was upon the face of the deep. The earth was a formless void. And the Bible says, God said, let there be light. So God speaks light into existence. He's here. It's chaotic. It's unformed. The Bible says, without form and void. The Spirit of God is moving. He's, he's moving over the face of the watery, chaotic mass of material. And God says, let there be light. There was light. And then it said God saw the light that he had made, that he had brought into existence. And he says that it was good. So God not only creates light, he evaluates the light and then says or sees this is good. This is good. We see this pattern all through the Genesis account of creation here in Genesis chapter 1. God speaks something into existence, and then God sees it. He evaluates it, and after each evaluation, God sees that it's good. I just want to just, just note with you several of these occasions from the creation narrative in Genesis chapter 1. In verses 9 and 10 it says, Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Now, God seeing that it was good is really meaningful. More meaningful than, say, me seeing that it was good. If you or I, or if you and I, were at, say, a museum or an art museum of sorts, and, and we were looking at a painting, and after observing the painting, after just 
analyzing and evaluating the painting, I looked at you and said, that's good. That statement, it's good, or that's good, or me seeing that that is good, is not really meaningful because you know what? I'm not much of a painter. I don't really have the qualifications necessary to gauge whether or not that's actually in any real sense good. But if perhaps we could resurrect Michelangelo from the dead and he were standing with us in that art museum as we evaluated the painting and as we evaluated the painting he looked at the painting and then he looked at us and he said, do you know what? That's good. The statement that's good would actually matter. It would actually mean something. Why? Because the one who's making it is, a, is, is qualified to say it. So God says, let there be light. He creates the seas. He divides the water from the water. And then he says, this is good. This is good. Now the statement, this is good, means something because of who's saying it. God's saying it. This is good. The statement, this is good, is only as meaningful as the person is qualified who is saying it. So when God says something is good, how good is it? It's as good as I guess good could be. Because who is more qualified to determine what is good and what is not good than God? Yeah? You could be there and go, this is good, and that's cool. Your evaluation means something, but it only means as much as you're qualified to make it. And so here's the illimitable God creating something out of nothing, evaluating what, evaluating what he made, and then saying, that's good. That statement means something. It means a lot. We go on. Um, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says God brings forth grass and the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, etc., etc. And God saw that it was good. We go again to verse 14 and 18. God saw that it was good. These are different points in the creation narrative. God saw once again that it was good. God finishes his creative acts in the six days of creation, and the Bible says, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was not just good, it was very good, very good. Once again, if God says it's very good, then it's very good. Now, transitioning into chapter two in Genesis, notice what the Bible here says. Thus the heavens, and the earth, and all the host of them, the Bible says, were finished. So get this course of thought through your head, okay? He creates, he evaluates, it's good. He creates, he evaluates, it's good. He gets finished with creation in totality, and he says, it's very good. And then the Bible says, thus, the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Now, how finished is something when God finishes it? It's as finished as finished can be. It's as complete as complete can be. In the strictest, most perfect sense, it's finished. You could take the most intelligent group of people that have ever lived in the history of the world and they can combine all of their intelligence and effort together and they can invent something. Okay? You, you, you could take the mass of all human intellect throughout all of the ages, you can combine it together and create a supercomputer that could create something or invent something. And, and it could be, in a sense, once it's invented that thing and engineered that thing and put that thing together, compiled it, you could say, in a sense, that the work that that, that that group of people did is finished. But at some point in the future, someone could come and improve upon what was created. So that group of people, that group of beings, no matter how smart, could never finish things the way that God would finish it. Not in the most complete and perfect sense. Do you follow what I'm saying? Anything any person could ever make can be added to or taken from. But not so in this case. When God finishes it, everyone, it's finished. 
That is to say, nothing can be taken from it and nothing can be added to it. A thousand years could go by and, and what God made could be evaluated from every angle, from every vantage point. And at every, t- at every point, the person evaluating would have to say, that's finished. That was, that was finished. Notice this text of scripture here. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 14. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Why? Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken away from it. All of the host of them, all of the creation, it's finished. How finished is finished? Absolutely, completely, in the most perfect sense, it's finished. In Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, God is conversing with a man who suffered very deeply. And he's giving him perspective. And in giving him perspective, we read this statement here, verses 4 through 7 in Job chapter 38. This is a part of a conversation between God and Job. And this is, this is what God says in this conversation. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To, to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? Now notice what God says. When the morning stars sang together, together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now this is a pretty powerful statement. The morning stars in context here, in the greater context of scripture, he's referencing angels. And God is in essence saying, where were you when I did all of this creating? And when I did all of this creating, did you know that the angels were so overcome, so overwhelmed, so amazed that they, they spontaneously shouted forth with singing and joy because it was just that beautiful and awesome and amazing and perfect and complete and finished. Now I want this to be solid in your mind. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's very good. It's finished. So much so, nothing can be taken from it. Nothing can be added to it, ever. And the angels are shouting and singing. We continue here in Genesis chapter 2. As soon as I give you a little illustration. Uh, Does anyone know who this is? Does anyone know his name? Bob Ross. Bob Ross. I've used this picture in Australia, and no Australians know who this is. But we Americans, most, some, some of us, especially those of us over the age of 40, <laughs> we know who this is. This is Bob Ross. And for all you young punks in the church this morning, um, you would know him, and that's okay. But this is a guy who used to do a TV show on public access television. And it's like the television um, that's always really boring. Um, and back in the, the, the old days, when you just had a TV with certain prescribed channels, and this was PBS was kind of one of the channels, and he did a show on PBS. And his show was real simple, but it was brilliant in its simplicity. And it was just Bob Ross doing paintings. Now, I'm not a painter, And uh, I'm really not the kind of person who is naturally drawn to people like Bob Ross. Bob Ross was kind of a hippie, kind of an artistic person. I'm not a hippie by any any stretch. And I'm not very artistic, not at all. I'm actually like the anti-artist in my heart. I'm just not artistic. But I was actually drawn to the show because of his talent, of his unique ability. And it was real simple. As I said, it was just Bob painting pictures, mostly of landscapes. And then he would talk you through the process as he was painting his painting. Now, one of the things that would just blow my mind about Bob is that he could always see things that I couldn't see. He he always knew what to add, right? How to shade, how to to enhance, just how to make something beautiful. He'd start with a blank canvas. And he would have this idea in his mind, and he would be able to translate that idea onto this blank canvas. And stage after stage after stage, the painting would get more and more beautiful, more and more amazing, more and more awesome. 
And, and as the show would progress, you would get more blown away by how awesome and amazing this guy Bob Ross was and how cool it was that he had this ability that he could translate into action and into a painting. And I remember, at, at, whenever I would watch Bob paint, there was always a, a point in, in the show where I would say, okay, Bob, stop. Just stop painting, Bob, just stop, because it can't get any more beautiful. It just can't get any better. And then he would add another element. He would add a little bit more to the painting. And I would think, no way, you're blowing my mind, Bob. You did it again. I, I couldn't imagine it could have gotten any better, but it did. So he'd paint, you know, the, the land. And, and I think, well, that's really amazing. That's good. That's awesome. And then he'd paint like a river. And he'd say, Whoa, that's even better. That's good. And then he'd get to, you know, he'd paint some clouds in the sky, and you'd think, that is amazing. And then he'd paint some sun shining through the clouds. And you'd think, whoa, you're blowing my mind, Bob. Stop. It's too beautiful. It's too awesome. You're going to mess it up. And then he'd add some more elements, some animals, and whatever else. And you'd think, that's good. That's good. And then finally, he'd get to, to the end of the painting. And when he would finish his paintings, he would sign his name at the bottom of the painting. Bob Ross. And his signature was a sign, it was a symbol that he, the artist, the great artist, Bob Ross, was finished. That he, with all of his intelligence and his skill, could add no more to the painting to make it any more beautiful than what it was. Bob Ross. God, similarly, did the same thing after he painted his painting and created his world. Notice this. The Bible goes on, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all of his work which God had created and made. So the Sabbath, a 24-hour period of time, at the end of God's six days of creating, in a similar sense to the painting of Bob Ross, served as a signature. I'm finished. I'm done. It's complete. It's perfect. So God blesses the Sabbath. He sets it aside and he rests on it. Now why is he resting? Why is he sitting back in rest, as it were. Surely not because he's tired, because he is the source of all of the energy that is. So why is he resting? Well, there's nothing else to do. It's finished. You follow? Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. He's just resting in the perfection of his creation, and he, he then institutes a commemoration, a memorial, by which it can be remembered what he did. And, furthermore, the character of what he did. It was perfect. There was no flaws. There was no decay. There was nothing defunct. There was nothing out of harmony. Nothing that defiles. Nothing that harms. Nothing that hurts. Nothing imperfect, impure, immoral, out of, out of harmony. Only perfect togetherness, completeness, happiness, health, and life. And so he rests on the Sabbath, and he sanctifies the Sabbath as a sign. Now, keep this in your minds, and then we just notice the memory text for this morning. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, so God institutes this holy time, this holy day at the end of the creation week. He rests on it to celebrate his finished very good work, okay? Then he enshrines this Sabbath day in his 10 moral commandments. So the objectively moral standard of God, right, isn't complete until the Sabbath is enshrined in its midst. And God says to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the Sabbath day that he set aside after creating the world. Now there's lots of reasons why you would say to someone to remember 
not the least of which would be because people are prone to forget. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I want to talk just, just, for, just for a few moments just about remembering the Sabbath day and how important it is to remember the Sabbath day. If you forget the Sabbath day, you can forget what the Sabbath represents. You can forget what the Sabbath means. You can forget what the Sabbath stands for. The Sabbath, I don't know how to say this. I'm, you know, you get in these positions where your mind is thinking 15 things and you know that you can only say two and you're striving real fast to decide which of those 15 you'll mention. The Sabbath is a reminder of the dignity of mankind, of the inherent worth of every man and every woman who is born. We have inherent value simply because of where we come from. And the Sabbath is a reminder of that fact. You forget where you come from, i.e. the hand of the Almighty God of the universe. And you may begin to think that you are merely the product of random chance and blind natural forces. And you may begin to believe, you may begin to think that there is no higher law than urge or instinct guttural, beastly instinct and urge and passion. And if you get to that place, you have lowered yourself down to the form of nothing but a brute beast. Remember the Sabbath day. Because the Sabbath day reminds you of where you come from, who you are, your inherent worth. You mean something. You matter. You were intended the infinite God of the universe birthed you into existence and he provided a magnificent, perfect, amazing environment. Why? Because he loves you and because he cares for you and because he's good. And if you forget the Sabbath, you might forget all of that. And you might begin to teach in your school systems that you're just the products of random chance and blind natural forces. And then your kids will go crazy and your society will fall apart. And you'll all think to yourselves, why in the world has the world gone crazy? Well, maybe, maybe it's because everyone's acting like an animal because we've been teaching everyone you're just an animal for the last 7,500 years. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember that people mean something. That they were made in the image of God. And that they were intended and purposed by the infinite creator of the universe. And treat them that way. And treat yourself that way. And see them that way. And see yourself that way. The Sabbath is a reminder of the goodness of God. And how God is generous. And when God made this world for us, he didn't think about how little he could give to make us happy. He, he, he thought about how much could he give to make us happy. And everything that we would ever need for our com contentment and happiness and wholeness was there in God's original creation. And the Sabbath reminds us of that fact, that there was nothing that defiles, there was nothing that harms. All the death and pain and insecurity and fear and worry and tragedy and death and misery in this life is not God's responsibility. It's not God's fault. It wasn't a part of God's creation. And the Sabbath reminds us of that fact. Remember the Sabbath day. And remember all that it means, all that it represents. And, 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 and the Bible says, you know, remember this day. And then it goes on to say how to keep the Sabbath day holy. God made the Sabbath day holy. And then it says how to keep it. Don't work and don't force anybody else to work. And then it says, in essence, um, why? Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth in, in six days. And he's blessed the Sabbath day. I'll just read the commandment real quick. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days will you labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you will do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. So in other words, it's saying, look guys, just follow my example. You stop your work after six days like I stopped my work of creation after six days. And in doing so, you will be memorializing, you will be commemorating what I did and who I am and what I represent and how I did things. So you stop. I stopped. You stop. And in you stopping, you're acknowledging what I did. 
and how I did it. And therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. So, um, this, what you see on the screen, it's a, it's a symbol. It's a sign. But materially, it's just cloth and ink. And in, our, in, our, in an artist's, it's an artistic depiction made of cloth and ink, right? It's an American flag, so it has blue, it has red, it has white, it has stars, it has stripes. Now, if I happen to have an American flag in my, in my jacket, and I pulled the American flag out of my jacket, right? The first thing that someone would think, perhaps, if they were very patriotic, is they would think, why does he have an American flag crumpled up in his pocket? That's a little bit disrespectful. But why would they think that that was in some way, shape, or form disrespectful when it's just a piece of cloth with paint on it? Well, we all know that it's not just a piece of cloth with paint on it. The flag has representative meaning. It's a symbol. It's a sign. And to crumple and crinkle a flag and just shove it into your pocket as if it's just a napkin is disrespectful, not because you need to respect cloth and paint, but you need to respect what the cloth and the paint represent. And so then let's just say I, I pulled the, cloth, the, the thing, I pulled it out of my pocket, and I threw it on the ground. Well, then somebody might say, well, that's really disrespectful, but then I might say, well, why is that disrespectful? It's just a piece of cloth with paint. No, it's not just a piece of cloth with paint. It's a symbol, it's a sign, and it represents something. It represents a people. It represents lives. It represents culture. It represents history. It represents the lives of people who aren't alive anymore because they died in service to that. And then I go over to the flag and I start stepping on it. I spit on it. It's just cloth. It's just paint. No, it's not. The seven-day Sabbath is not just a day. It's a symbol. And to disrespect the day is to disrespect what the day represents. And the day represents all that God is and all that God has done, his kingdom, his laws, his life, his creative power, his sovereignty over the universe. The earth is created in the context of the great controversy and is a sign in the midst of the great controversy of God's right to govern and rule the universe. And he attaches this sign, this symbol at the end of creation so that all could remember who he is and what he has done and how he has done it. And so surely you don't, you don't just stick it in your pocket right, and crumple it up. Surely you don't just throw it on the ground and step on it. Why? Because you're a decent enough person to have a sense of respect for what matters. Now, I um, <clears throat> just want to fast forward here to... <clears throat> Excuse me. You think that was bad? You should have heard me last week. <clears throat> John chapter 1, John begins his gospel with, In the beginning was the Word. Obviously, John the disciple, when beginning his story of Jesus, wants to point our attention to the Genesis creation account. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John, in the beginning, was the Word. You jump down to verse 14 in John chapter 1, and it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when John says, in the beginning was the Word, you could, you could, you could change the word word for Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus. He goes on to say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Now, I just want to make a side point here about this text. If all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made, this means he couldn't have been made. Because nothing that was made was made without him, and therefore he's the creator of all things. He has no beginning. In him is life. He's self-existent. 
in the same sense that God the Father is self-existent. He's not a contingent being. His life and his existence, according to John and other New Testament passages, is not dependent upon any other personal being. In the truest, most genuine, most absolute sense, Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, the express thoughts of God, the communicative agent of the Godhead. And the Word, the communicative agent with, with, of God, was with God. Okay, so he was with God the Father, yet at the same time, he was God, according to John. He was in the beginning at the creation, and then it says, all things were made through him. John wants you to know, as he begins his gospel, that this guy Jesus who came on God's behalf to save humanity was actually the one who created the earth. And there was nothing that has ever been made at all without qualification that was made without him, which infers he himself does not have a beginning there is no distant point in some eternal past where he kind of came into being. If you hear any like person who really emphasizes like the fatherhood of, of God and the sonship of Jesus, which is all really good and important, and then they kind of try to start pulling you aside and undermining to some extent, to some degree, the full divinity of Christ, I want to say to you, call them out. Call them out and ask them to, to, to they're, they're just, this is just, I hate to kind of do these types of things, but I'm just going to do it just for this, because I, I'm just going to do it. Non-Trinitarianism in Australia, it's, it's becoming rampant and rife, and some of our people have hopped on over to North America. And there's, there's an MO, there's a way of, of these guys functioning. What they generally do is they, they impress people with their spiritual prowess, and their relative knowledge of certain scriptural passages. And then they try to find people who will be impressed with them. They draw near to those people and try to lead those people away from biblical orthodoxy and, a, and an understanding of the full divinity of Christ. And they generally work undercover, very surreptitiously, very subtly. And they don't come up front and they're not generally honest. And so, be aware. It's a travesty. But anyways, the sermon is not about non-Trinitarianism, but Make a mention of that. This idea that Jesus is the creator in the fullest, truest sense is not unique, as most of you know, to John the Apostle. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So there it is. According to Paul, all things were created through Jesus Christ. That person who became a baby and had to learn how to speak, according to Paul, was the, the actual creator who in the beginning said, let there be light, and there was light. Paul also says in Colossians 1.16, for by him, Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. According to the Bible, Jesus was not merely a man. He was the creator God in human form. And why did the Creator become our Redeemer? Now this is an important question. Why not send an angel? Why not create a special being to come and represent God? Here's why. It was because the act of redemption, the act of saving and redeeming mankind, was an act of creation. God did not merely have to reform mankind. He had to recreate it. And that's what he did. You'll notice in scripture, and this is, this is a big topic, I know, but I'm just briefing on it for, for a very important point, and I'll pull all the pieces together, and you'll see why I've preached the message that I'm preaching. Um, you'll notice in scripture that oftentimes, creation is attached to the idea of salvation. There's some very popular biblical passages that most of you guys would know from the top of your head. Um, in Psalm 51, the Bible says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. So here's the psalmist referencing the joy of God's salvation and saying that he needs God to create in him a clean heart. 
If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, creature or creation. Behold, the former things have, have passed away, and all things have become new. In Christ, salvation language, creation language. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 8, the Apostle Paul, he says, For you are saved by grace through faith, not of the, your works, lest any person should boast. So he's talking about salvation. And then later on in the passage, he says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So you see in, in, in Scripture, oftentimes the notion, the idea, the concept of salvation, God redeeming the world, God... Uh, purchasing us back, as it were, is tied together with this, side, this idea of creation. Jesus, according to the Bible, is the second Adam. In Adam, we all die, but in Christ, we shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. So, in Adam, right, every single one of us was perverted, was defiled, became genetically, morally depraved. It is as if almost Adam was the seed of the human race, right? And if the seed is corrupt, the tree will be corrupt. And we've all grown out of Adam's corruption and are inherently sinful, inherently bent, inherently broken. And our choices have just kind of, we've, 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 we've encouraged that through wrong choices and wrong actions. But Jesus takes the place of Adam. And God lays on Jesus the iniquity of us all. That is to say, all of the sins you've ever committed, all of the evil you've ever been is laid on Jesus. God lays on him the iniquity of us all. And he buries that in the ground. Don't you know that those of us who were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? In a very real way that I can't fully understand or explain, in a very real way, the human race was placed on Jesus and was punished in the person of Jesus. And he goes into the grave and he leaves dead humanity in the grave and he, and he was resurrected. The genetic potential for every single one of us existed in Adam. Right? Adam and Eve, in them, existed the genetic potential for every single one of us. When their genetic makeup was defiled and depraved by sin, we inherently, we became the inheritors of that. But, the potential for the spiritual restoration of every human person exists in Jesus. So he takes, he takes the fallenness of humanity and he takes it into the ground. And he resurrects a new Adam, a new humanity. And as Adam gave you his spiritual and physical disposition, the fallen spiritual and physical disposition, Jesus offers you, right, the new, elevated, restored spiritual and physical disposition of heaven. And so the creator becomes the redeemer because the act of redemption was an act of recreation. Like an actual act of recreation. And it begins when Jesus comes and begins his earthly ministry. It continues in his heavenly ministry. And it's finalized at the second coming. Jesus is the creator, God of the universe, who made this world at the beginning. And once it fell, he took responsibility for the fall. And he came into the world. And he's in the process right now of recreating it. And that's why the New Testament is so adamant on, on pointing our attention to the fact that Jesus is creator. We don't just need to be reformed, we need to be recreated. Dead, buried, destroyed, left behind, and then renewed in Jesus fully. Now, um, I probably haven't explained all of this perfectly, but I think you get the point. Now, here's uh, the last uh, verse I wanna share with you from scripture. You can turn with me as quickly as you possibly can to Luke chapter 23. Um, While you're turning to Luke chapter 23, I just want to just, just give you a quick recap. Let there be light, 
and there was light. God saw that it was good. Divided the waters from the waters, saw that it was good. Creates the land animals, the various agents of the environment. It's very good. He sees everything that he makes. It's very good. The works of God are finished. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it because God's just that good and awesome and amazing. And he commemorates all of that awesomeness and goodness with the Sabbath. He then enshrines the Sabbath into the ten moral commandments that he commits to humankind. And he says to remember. He says to remember. Jesus himself is the creator. The act of redemption is an act of recreation. And then we now here are in Luke chapter 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 23, and we'll begin reading in verse 54. The Bible says in Luke chapter 23 and verse 54, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And by the way, that day was the day where Jesus was, was crucified. And the women who had come with him from Galilee, they followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, this is interesting. He dies on Friday. The women who followed him continue to follow him. And then they, they, they choose to rest on the Sabbath, and that's similarly a time where Jesus is resting in death in the grave. Now in verse 1 of chapter 24 it says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the tombstone, this tombstone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in, and they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, here we have an account of some of the female followers of Jesus wanting to anoint his body on the day that he was crucified. But the Sabbath comes and so they rest. And this is the day that they put Jesus' body into the tomb. And then they come on Sunday, the first day of the week, to anoint his body. But he's not there. He's been resurrected. Now Jesus, just before he died, hanging on the cross, you'll remember, he says, it is finished. Interesting. The Sabbath initially began in Earth's history. That's not the right language, but the, the Sabbath was initially a commemoration, a memorial of God's creation in Eden. After the fall, after the ministry of Jesus, it now becomes a commemoration of God's redeeming power in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus was not just Redeemer, He was Creator. And the Creator had to become the Redeemer because the act of redemption was not just some random act, it was an act of creation that could only be performed by the Creator God of the universe. God creates, and throughout the course of the creation, account, it's good, it's good. It's very good. Do you think that through the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, you could say at certain points in time, that's good. That's good. That's good. Do you think you could get to the cross and go, that's very good. As Jesus rested after the work of creation, he rested after, wor after the work of recreation, after the work of redemption. The Sabbath is a sign it's a sign of God's unfailing love, of his unfailing goodness, his justice, his wonder. He creates the world and it's perfect and it's finished. It's finished. It's absolutely, completely, perfectly finished. But it's distorted and defiled and devastated by sin. And what does God do? Does he abandon? Does he run? Does he destroy? Does he devastate? He would have been just to do so, but he takes responsibility. And in the person of himself, he rescues, he salvages, he restores, he recreates. And the Sabbath 
the original commemoration of that first creative act now is expanded in meaning and becomes the commemoration, the memorial of that second act of creation, the act of recreation. Remember the Sabbath day. You know, there's this kid, just two little quick anecdotes and then we're off to lunch. Um, so there's a kid and he uh, was middle school age, 12, 13 years old, and he was going to school in New York City. And he, I meant to, he was a good kid. He was decent. He was respectful. He was honest. He was very different than a lot of the kids around him. Very different. And his teachers were really amazed by him. How, how could he be such a, a good and decent kid, such a virtuous kid, in the midst of the situation that he was in? Most of the kids in his school, disrespectful, rebellious, selfish, and perverse. And one of his teachers, she approached him one day and she said, kid, this is unreal. How is it that you can, you can be how you are here? Grew up in the Bronx, nasty, terrible neighborhood he was in. How can you be this in the midst of all of this? How can you, how can you do that? It must be your dad. He must be a fantastic man. He must be a good man. He must have, have shown you such a fantastic example. He must be such a strong and noble person that you draw from his strength and you're able to be noble and decent in this nasty cesspool of selfishness. And he says, no, my dad's dead. And she says, I'm sorry, but I just don't understand. Is it, it must be your mom. It must be your mom. She, she, just, she must be the most wonderful woman. She must provide for you such an amazing home that you can be restored and rejuvenated there so that you can come here and be decent. And he said, no, my mom's dead too. And she felt terrible for even saying these things and bringing it up. But she says, what is it about you, kid? I'm just amazed by you. What is it? And he said, well, you know I'm from Africa. But what you didn't know is that my mother and my father, they were, the, they were the queen and the king of my country. And there was a military uprising, and they took my mom and my dad, and they, they threw them in prison. And they sentenced them to death. And before their execution, I was allowed to see them uh, one last time. And so we held each other, and we wept. And my dad, he, he asked me, Son, will you promise me something? Will you promise me something, son? And he said, I'll, I'll promise you anything, Dad. I'll do anything you ask me to do. He said, son, you promise me that wherever you go, whatever happens to you, whatever circumstances you find yourself in, you'll never forget that you will always remember that you're the son of a king. He said, ma'am, I have never forgotten from that day to this that I'm the son of a king and that's why I act like it. Remember the Sabbath day. You're children of the king. And through all the tragedy, God has arisen to save us. He redeemed us, he made us in his image. That image was distorted, and then he recreates us in the person of his son, and he asks us to look and to live and to accept and allow his spirit to recreate us and to change us back to that image. And the Sabbath is a sign that he's done it in Christ. Nothing can be added to what Jesus has done. Nothing can be taken from it. It was finished. What are you going to add to the saving act of Jesus? Nothing. You can submit to it, you can respond to it, but you can't add to it. It's finished. Um, 
So this suit, uh, this suit, it's blue. It's a Tommy Hilfiger suit. I think it's pretty nice. It's not why I wear it, necessarily. I just wear it because I have to wear suits. I'm not really a fan of suits. I wish I lived in Fiji. I can just wear different kinds of formal clothing. Uh, my memory for, of suits is, is a pretty harsh memory. You think my mom's nice? Well, she, well sometimes. Um, <laughs> when she converted and gave her life to God, after going to a series of evangelistic meetings, she began to force me, like a dictator, to go to church. Can I get an amen from you, from you, from you, from you, ten-year-olds? Two different kinds of amens there. And uh, I grew up in Key West, Florida. Key West, Florida is very hot. It's very hot. And my first memories of church were a suit that didn't fit that my mom got from. I don't know where she got it, probably from a place that gives poor people clothes because we were pretty poor. So some suit that didn't fit that was virtually like getting choked out by an MMA wrestler. Just choked you out. And um, yeah, I just sat in this hot, nasty church. And that was my first memories of having to wear a suit. And so my mom traumatized me. Job, so now I grudgingly wear suits. But I brought this suit all the way from Australia, even though I'm on holiday. And, uh, yeah, this suit. I wasn't going to bring a suit. Because I'd prefer not to have to pack a suit for my holiday time. And even though I was preaching, I thought that you guys would be gracious to me. And not, not judge me or worry if I wasn't wearing a suit. I was just going to wear a nice shirt like that guy's got on right there. Just a nice, you know, collared shirt. Relaxed, it's good for a holiday and vacation. But I wore this suit, I brought this suit, and I brought it, because this is a suit that I wore at my dad's funeral. You see, it kind of serves as a sign, as a symbol. So he gets cancer. It, it was a, you know, it was, very, it was very, very sad and very pathetic to watch such a noble person, such a strong person, a warrior who fought for his country, who decided to take the responsibility for a family that he didn't create, for kids to raise them and to, to do right, to waste away with cancer, become skinny, frail. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. You just watch as someone who you love, someone you admire, succumbs to mortality and to the wages of sin. And we're all subject and we all end up in the same place. No matter how rich or strong or powerful or beautiful, we all go down to the grave and there is no escape save Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior Amen. who commemorated the saving act through the Sabbath, through resting on the Sabbath. And I wear this suit as a sign of God's unfailing love in hope and in trust that God will raise my dad from the dead. Today I pray that you will have a renewed commitment to God and renewed appreciation for the sign, for the Sabbath, for all that it represents, all that it means, the hope, the goodness, the greatness, and the love, and the life of heaven, and the God of heaven. God is good, and God has assigned to us the Sabbath so that we can never forget that fact. Hopefully, this suit will last a long time. And perhaps, um, perhaps I'll see my dad again. The Sabbath is a similar sign. Who have you lost? What have you suffered? The Sabbath reminds you that it will end, and God has overcome. 
God will come again. God bless you. Yep. Amen.